No. There we go. Okay. Did you find a different mic that you wanted me to use? <laughs> Should I just go for it? Keep going. Okay, cool. Uh, quick shout out to all the my fellow ladies in the room. Y'all need more women here, by the way. But it does make the bathroom lines a lot easier, so thanks for that. Um, <laughs> So my name is Alexia. Um, I work at Intel as one of the developers on Live Fabric. Um, I'm here to talk about a lot of the development that we've been doing in regards to the utility providers. If you don't know what a utility provider is, it's basically a way to abstract common routines such as completion counters uh, or completion queues, completion counters, atomics. Uh, tag batching, things like that. So we abstract that into common code and then uh, implement these utility providers that can focus more on specific routines or protocols uh, to enhance other providers. So the aim is to layer them on top of core providers um, to add features or increase the message size, things like that. Um, so I'll be walking through specifically three utility providers that we've done a lot of work on in the last year or two and uh, what they do, focus on uh, the protocols that they're implementing and how they help the core providers. Um, so this is a general overview of how utility providers um, plug into the core providers. So at the bottom you have, for example, our message endpoint core providers such as TCP and Verbs. Um, so those would be, could use the utility provider OFI RxM, which is reliable uh, datagram over a message interface. Um, and then to the app, they would expose a reliable datagram endpoint, uh, such as TCP, RxM, or Verbs RxM. We also have uh, the RxD provider, which would be implementing reliable datagram over uh, unreliable datagram. And so some of those unreliable datagram endpoint support core providers are things like UDP, Verbs over UD, and P PSM2, which has a UD mode. So you can layer those together, and then to the app, you can expose that reliable datagram endpoint UDP, RxD, Verbs, RxD, PSM2, RxD. The last one I'll be talking about, <clears throat> uh, it's not actually layered over a core provider, but you could potentially use it in conjunction with a core provider, and that's the shared memory provider, which is a standalone provider for intranode communication, which uses a shared memory region for that communication. So I'll be talking about that as well. <clears throat> So first up is the RxM provider. Like I said, this is reliable datagram using the message core provider. Um, so we have um, n number of message endpoints internally in order to handle this uh, connection multiplexing uh, for that core provider. Um, but we expose that RDM endpoint to the app. So it basically adds an RDM endpoint that has full message tagged RMA and atomic functionality, but using that core provider message endpoint. Um, it uses the provider specifically with the messaging uh, interface and also the RMA, it uses that as well. Um, the main protocols that we have to implement uh, are things handling the connection management and the connection multiplexing, trying to reduce the number of resources um, and overhead in order to establish these connections. And we also have a memory registration uh, verbs provider um, that we have to take into account. <clears throat> We're targeting verbs, TCP, or basically any propriety hardware with reliable connected semantics that has that messaging interface. And with the RxM provider, we're targeting a few hundred nodes here. So I'll go over the connection management, which is a big chunk of the code, uh, is how do we establish these connections? And again, how do we reduce the resources and create on-demand connections so we don't have to create all these connections if we're not going to actually need them? Um, so I'll just walk through a basic example. Let's say you have those three endpoints trying to communicate, one that's communicating to both of them and the other two that are receiving messages from that larger endpoint. So we create those endpoints. We expose the RDM endpoint to the app. And internally, we create a passive endpoint with that message provider. <coughs> we create our address vectors. Um, like I said, the one on the left is communicating with both of the peers. And let's those two peers are sharing an address vector to communicate back with the larger endpoint. Um, so when we call that endpoint bind and enable that communication, we call listen on that passive endpoint. But notice we still haven't created any of those connections and message endpoints internally. <coughs> 
when we call our first set, when the app initiates that first send on message endpoint zero, for example, it's then that we call that connect to the passive endpoint. And the receiving endpoint will notice that we don't have a message endpoint, create it and accept that connection. And again, that can happen um, multiple peers. So we've established those two connections only when we've actually needed them. That's a basic example. There is um, a case with simultaneous connections specifically used um, in things such as MPI where you have both sides initiating that send at the same time. So you could be dealing with two simultaneous uh, connection requests. Um, so I'll just walk through quickly how that goes down. Um, so simple example, we have two endpoints trying to communicate with each other. Again, we create those endpoints internally creating that passive endpoint. Um, then we create that address vector, bind and listen, and like I said, in this situation, we'll be calling the send simultaneously. According to the last example, what you might be doing is connecting with both of those and have two unnecessary connections. So when this weird case happens, we actually look at the IP addresses, or the source addresses, which is the IP address and the port, um, and reject the lower of the two. Um, so we still only have that one accepted uh, connection and reject the unneeded one. So we still are reducing those resources and trying to optimize with those connections. <clears throat> so that's the connection management protocols. Um, in terms of the messaging protocols, we have three main protocols um, in order to handle uh, the various different message sizes. First one is a very simple, eager message. The main consideration that we have to uh, take into account is the MR registration. Uh, so we use pre-registered MRs um, for the transmit and the receive side buffers. So we copy our data into a pre-registered MR, uh, send it using the core provider's FI send function, and receive it and copy it into the receive buffer. We do have a quick path with the FI inject since it doesn't actually need the pre-registered buffers. Really that arrow should be pointing directly from the transmit to the receive side buffer. Um, so it's not perfect, sorry. Um, so that's eager message, simple segmentation and reassembly. You uh, are putting the larger message into the smaller packets, sending them over one by one, reassembling and saving into the receive side buffer. Again, this is all with pre-registered packet buffers. The last one is our rendezvous protocol. So the thing we're trying to avoid here is unnecessary memory registration on the NIC until you actually need it. So we have these larger buffers, the transmit buffer uh, that needs to go to the receive. Um, and so we'll walk through that. The first step is we register that entire memory region on the transmit side. We send it uh, a request using one of these pre-registered buffers. Uh, we finally register that memory region on the receive side, um, then do an RMA read on the transmit, uh, the transmit buffer, and this is using the core RMA read function. And then close that memory region and then send an ACK back, which initiates that closing of the MR. So we're not actually using these big, big buffers unless we need them as uh, more on demand. So that's mostly the RxM uh, provider. Again, most of the protocols dealing with that connection management for the uh, core provider and also those protocols. <clears throat> so the RxC provider, like I said, is reliable datagram over an unreliable datagram core provider. Uh, so it looks a little different. We don't need one internal datagram endpoint for every connection, uh, but we just have a one-to-one -one relationship between the RDM endpoint and the unreliable uh, core provider. Uh, and then those are each talking to the peer. Like the RxM provider, it actually implements a full messaging tagged RMA and atomic functionality that we expose to the user. Um, and most of the um, work here is dealing with that core provider messaging interface. Um, we segmentize because the unreliable core provider is usually with a small packet. So there's a lot of segmentation we need to do. Um, like I said, most of the work is trying to deal with this flow control, trying to track the packets, to retransmit them, and putting them back together on the receive side since we might get them out of order. Um, and like the RxM provider, we do have memory region registration considerations to take into account for the core providers. Uh, we're targeting verbs, UD, uh, UDP, and any hardware with unreliable datagram semantics. Um, and in this case, we're actually targeting much more uh, nodes. So we're targeting thousands of nodes here. Uh, so flow and scaling is a big consideration that we have to take into account here. So walking through the protocols, we don't have the connection management. 
to deal with, uh, but we deal with specifically trying to retry, resend these packets as we notice that one of them has been dropped. So simple eGirl protocol, save into the receive buffer, and then copy that into the receive side. Um, again, we're dealing with pre-registered transmit and receive memory regions. And here we have to time and retry the if we if we don't get an ACK and we need to resend it. <coughs> um, this will follow the next example with the uh, segmentation and reassembly protocol. Uh, so it follows, it, you could plug it in and see how the timing is done. So here's an example of the segmentation and reassembly. Simple example with a transmit that requires six packets and then another one that requires three. Again, you could plug in the simple eager right into this in order to see how the retransmits are dealt with. So let's say we have a window size. Do I have a new one? Sweet. Excellent. Make sure you don't miss anything. <clears throat> cool. So we have uh, two, does it work? Yeah. Um, we have two sends that we're doing, one a little bit larger and one a little bit smaller. Let's say we have our window here, which is that bracket. So the window basically determines how many packets we can send at once so we don't overflow or uh, over, um, overcrowd the network and end up with a lot of drop packets. Uh, so here we have a window of four because we have bad windowing. Uh, so we have four packets we can only send at uh, a time. So the first step is we said we try all those packets one time. On the receive side, we might get zero, packet zero, packet one, packet two, which we can save straight into the receive buffer, but maybe packet three was dropped. Um, so the transmit side will retry packet zero, we'll get packet zero, notice that they're out of order, and send an ACK back to the peer. Um, so we'll say we got packets up to two, but then something, you retried something, we dropped something. So, um, the transmit side can then shift that window over uh, and clear up the packet zero, one, and two. So it'll retry that three, four, five, and six. So we send three, four, five, and six, finally get three, four, five, save them into our buffer, and we actually send an ACK back here to tell the peer we're done with one of our sentences. So we ACK that five back, shift over our window again, um, finally get the seven and eight, send them through and we've received all our messages. So like I said, this would also happen on that eager protocol that it's just a one-to-one -one ratio, <clears throat> but it would fit in like it does in the segmentation and reassembly in terms of the timing and retrying. Cool. Okay, a quick note on a note or a mode that we have in there of out of order reassembly. So basically what this mode does is it turns off the retrying of the packets and only focuses on uh, reassembling those packets. So it assumes that that core provider is actually going to be reliable, uh, but all the packets might come out of order. So we need to focus our energy on putting them back together. Uh, this specifically has to do with what Raghu was talking about in terms of their RxR provider. So this is um, an attempt at trying to push those two things into one provider so we minimize our code base. So I'll just talk about it real fast. It's similar to the other examples. So same example, just using this no retrying and just segmentation and reassembly mode. Uh, we send our packets just once so we don't have to time them and check for uh, retries. So we get zero, one, maybe three, two, so we can save them directly into the receive buffer in their appropriate places, um, and then act that window back, shift that window like before. But let's say we got four and seven, we can't actually process seven yet because that's in a new receive, uh, in a new message. And the first message, the so packet six, will actually have all that header information in order to match it to a receive buffer. So we can't process that yet, but we can't also ignore it because we won't get that retry. So we buffer it into a separate list. Let's say we get six, we buffer it as well in that uh, buffered packet list in order. Uh, then finally get that five so we can finish that message and then process six and seven into that new receive buffer. So we're actually always processing the messages or the packets in the right order, regardless of how we got them. And then finally we act that seven, shift that window, 
send that eight. Um, big caveat here is that it's still under construction, so please don't try to go crazy on it just yet. Uh, more of just uh, this is in progress, and if you're interested in it or if you have a way to test it, love to talk to you about that. Um, so. Cool, that's RxD provider. Again, most of the work there is trying to retry the packets, time them, um, and not to do with the connection management like the RxM. So next uh, utility provider is the shared memory. So this is a standalone provider. It doesn't actually use a core provider implementation. It's standalone and only used for local internode communication. But you could potentially use it in conjunction with a core provider in order to offload your internode communication and use it for that. Uh, similar setup to the datagram or RxD provider uh, with that one-to-one -one relationship of the RDM endpoint that we're exposing to the app and the shared memory region. So instead of that shared memory or instead of that core provider endpoint that we're using, we're actually using a shared memory region to use for that communication. Like the other utility providers, uh, it exposes an RDM endpoint with full message tagged RMA anatomic functionality. And like I said, it is a standalone provider. So. Uh, it's not actually layered with a core. It has a per endpoint shared memory region, like I said. Um, and a quick note that it is currently disabled on all non-Linux platforms because it uses CMA, though we have XPMM to progress. But XPMM is a little confusing if you've never used it before. So working on it. <clears throat> so quick overview on the shared memory structure. We're not actually using the core provider endpoint, so we have the shared memory structure that we use for that communication. It has some various endpoint initialized information or resources such as process ID, which we need for that CMA call, uh, the endpoint name, the locks, the maps, stuff like that. We have a single command queue for incoming messages that peers can access, a response queue that the transmit side might use to allocate a, a response for an ACK, a message that might need an ACK, a pool of bounce buffers for medium-sized messages, so just a chunk of memory, and then a peer map for address exchange, which I'll walk through in a bit. So in terms of this address exchange, we're trying to basically get information from our peers without having to send and receive a message and exchange all this information. So we want to, when we send a message, to be able to look into that peer region or in, into our address map and send over what the peer's address for that uh, endpoint is without having to exchange that. So when we initialize all these resources, we do this little address exchange. So I'll walk through this example. Let's say we have four different endpoints. We'll just go endpoint one, two, three, and four. First endpoint to initialize its resources, let's say, is endpoint one. It inserts into the address vector, uh, addresses zero, one, and two, and with the peer names. But because none of the peers have been initialized, can't access that shared memory region. So we just set all of them as unspecified. Next one to get there, let's say is in point four. It can still insert all the addresses, uh, but this time when it ad adds endpoint one, it notices it has been initialized. It updates its own uh, FI address for that peer and also updates it in the peer. So that's done on initialization of that endpoint four. Endpoint three gets there next, initializes the endpoints that have been initialized, um, and then finally endpoint two adds it. So at the end of all the initialization of all the shared memory regions, this is what we have um, to work with. So if endpoint two sends, it to end, or sends a message to endpoint three, let's say, it can look up in its address map what that endpoint said its address was for that exchange. Going over the protocols, it uh, has three main protocols that we use those shared memory structures, the command uh, queue, the response queue, the inject buffer pool, um, to transfer those depending on the size of the message. So the first one is just an inline message. Let's say it can fit straight into one of the commands in the command queue. I think right now this is about 128 bytes, so a nice small message can fit right in there, and that receive side would take the information directly from that command. Next one is using that pool of bounce buffers. So we still save as much memory as we can into that command. And then it also holds that offset for that inject buffer. And then we copy the rest of the data from that inject buffer. And then the last one is an IOV or large message, which has to use that CMA or potentially XPMEM in the future. So we still save into the command the information that we need for that transfer, which also includes the addresses or the uh, the memory that we are trying to copy from, that buffer, and also 
um, an offset for that response or that ACK for that peer. So the peer would find that command, go to that CMA buffer, initiate a CMA read on that data, and then update the status in that response slot. So those are the three main protocols. Quick note on a fast path that we can use. Um, so basically, this, the idea is that we use a CMA directly from source to target without having to go through the shared memory region um, if we want to. This is optional and has a few limitations on it, but I thought I'd go over it. Um, so this is the CMA right call in case you've never seen it before. What we need is the process ID, for example, which we get from the shared memory region uh, from our peer. And then we also have these virtual addresses that we need in order to uh, make that call. So, Basically, the limitations are we need the MR mode bit, MR virtual address, so we have that virtual address and not using an offset. We also can't uh, enforce RMA ordering, so we, if you've, the app requested read after read, read after write, we can't actually ensure that since some of the operations might be directly uh, completed. And then uh, the message also can't be a CQ data message because that has to go through the command queue in order to send that extra information to the peer. So that's the fast path. In terms of future enhancements for all three of these providers, um, go through over them. The RxM, what we're looking at is trying to reduce the header um, um, overhead in terms of trying to initialize these packets. We're trying to improve startup times with that connection managing portion. Uh, trying to look at MR cache improvements. So the MR registration can be pretty costly, so trying to optimize that as much as possible. Adding some hardware specific optimi optimizations and then also looking at the rendezvous protocol. So that's sending the uh, request and then doing an RMA read on that data. Uh, instead of the request and then read, we'd actually request and then write to the buffer and then do an ACK also. Uh, and the reason behind that is there's been shown improvements of doing a write instead of a read. Uh, so looking into that possibility. Uh, for the RC provider, looking at threading and progress modes. Right now, it only supports manual progress, so trying to auto-progress that. Uh, looking at performance, obviously, um, some packet buffering that we talked about in terms of the out-of-order reliable uh, mode. So trying to look at try buffering those packets in order to avoid resending and dropping packets more. Looking at trying to scale up this provider and adding more flow control optimizations. Um, and again, that reliable assembly protocol that we talked about. And in terms of the shared memory, threading progress, again, like the RxD, it only supports manual progress. So looking at extending that to auto progress, performance is a big one too. Looking at non-host memory transfers, so using GPUs, for example, um, and then of course XPMEM, which I need to figure out. Um, and then also throwing uh, the multi-rail is another uh, utility provider that you might have heard of. Took a little hiatus from development, but it's basically back under development. So if you do have questions about that, I might not be able to answer them, but I can assure you that we're working on it. <laughs> so yeah, that is the overview. And I'll take questions if you have them. It made perfect sense. Yeah? Great. <laughs> Kind of Great, cool. <laughs> Challenged you. <laughs> I mean, this is interesting and all, but why are you writing new protocols? I mean, there are protocols that assemble datagrams into segments. And yeah, we're basically just, yeah. yeah, we're basically trying to include it all in LibFabric so that we can um, support different combinations. So let's say your hardware is unreliable and you're using LibFabric, that you could do it internally. So okay. it does exist, and we're putting it into LibFabric, basically. Okay. Cool. Sure. Do you have any information about relative performance? Uh, no, I don't. Um, RxM, we've done some performance stuff. Not that um, I can speak to that. That was developed by another uh, developer. But in terms of RxD and Shmem, they're very young in their development, so we haven't done too many uh, metrics on that. So, TBA. Cool. 